Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a joint Salu Acer seminar. Today we have Scott Tinker. Uh, Scott is like a comparative historical sociologist who has to study race, class, technology, in modernity. He's coming to present to, today to us his third book. His first two books were Capital, State, and Fire, The New American Ways of Digital Warfare. And his second book was, was Algorithms and Then Politics. And today he's going to talk to us about the political economy of fortune and historical of fortune. And he's a research associate with ICT Africa, where he leads the AI and democracy team. He's also a research associate with the University of Johannesburg Center for Social Change, and an affiliate with the Center of Information, Technology, and Public Life uh, of the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. And he has held fellowships at the Center of African Studies, the University of Leeds, and the Center of Advanced Internet Studies. So, well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, <laughs> it's my pleasure to come speak to you today about some work that I've been doing for uh, quite some time. This is uh, the culmination of maybe almost a decade's work of reading. That's a very bright light. Um, so I'm going to speak for about 30, 35, 40-ish minutes. We'll see how long it goes. I'll probably end up running out of steam, and then we can go to uh, questions from the floor. My central concern as a, as a scholar is about social inequality in its various dimensions. Uh, the state-based forms, its cultural-based forms, how is it perpetuated, what's it reproduction, and what types of interventions can we make to try and address these things. The talk that I'm giving today is a bit more fundamental. It's talking at the level of the kinds of co uh, conceptual cosmologies that we use to try and understand cause and effect and attribution of the events that organize our lives. And so I think that there's a degree of product, productivity to be had with thinking at this level of abstraction. But thinking at this level of abstraction doesn't, of course, discount other methods of inquiry, other techniques, so on and so forth. To think about the notion of contingency, we'll, we'll work with that language today, at the level of radical contingency, how it sort of shapes our entry points into the world, I want to start with a little bit of a story. And it's a story that many of us in South Africa have on either end of it. One of my formative experiences is going down to my grandfather's farm in KwaZulu-Natal. School holidays, Easter holidays, December trips, so on and so forth. And when, was, when we were on the farm, there were a number of playmates I had. Naturally, or by, by nature of society that we were in in, the, in, South, in South Africa in the 1980s, these were my black playmates. They were playmates, they were the children of the farm workers. And as we started to grow in age, I start to realize that there are these boundaries between what our lives will be. There are certain types of trajectories that were both open to me, encouraged, and constructed for me to follow, where for my playmates, who, uh, when I was very young, meant were quite dear to me, those trajectories were off the table. There weren't even considerations. They weren't even open to the imagination to think about what their lives could be. It was very much set there. Um, these types of pathways, affordances, encouragements have led me to travel the world, to do my PhD abroad, to go be a scholar abroad, and ultimately to come back to type, do the type of work that I've been doing. My black playmates on the other hand are still on a farm and they're effectively living a kind of a surf life. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but at a level of abstraction, that's what it is. I think that this basic example speaks not only to the type of agenda to think about contingency and how it shapes our entry points into the world and where we go from the world, but also how strict constraint that's maintained through institutional order shows the way that people experience fundamental limits uh, to the ability to transcend their class uh, status and otherwise improve their conditions for themselves. Oftentimes, when we think about mobility in capitalist societies, you know, we sometimes confuse occupational mobility with class mobility. We think about you know, improvements of in, in income or improvements in status, but we don't really think about other types of qualitative elements and non-qualitative non elements, the ability to set your terms and hours, the ability to you know, uh, uh, generate uh, rents from the assets that you acquire. There's quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, interclass mobility, but not much class mobility. People like my black playmates, it's very unlikely, almost impossible, 
that they will be able to rise uh, and become a Yahan um, Rupert, for example. It's sort of within these parameters, real parameters, the grounded parameters that shape everyday life in South Africa that I want to talk about social body and situated. Again, these things aren't necessarily, these things are abstract, but they also have real consequences. I want to tell another story. And that's looking at Glasgow graveyards from the 19th and 18th century. In industrial Scotland, in Edinburgh, the way that the dead were commemorated uh, mattered a great deal. When scholars go and study the memorial sites, the sites of memorization, memorialization, they find that the rich have more ornate, bigger, larger graves compared to the poor. What this shows is that even in death, inequalities are present and visible. They're detectable. Same thing is true when you dig up the bones, you can see the quality of life a person has had. This, this isn't a matter of the bones, this is a matter of the dead, it's also a matter of the living. The other thing is we notice that the people who had the big obelisks and memorializations lived longer. Men uh, who had the big obelisks and big memorializations average 65 years and women 63. By contrast, the poor had a decade less. 52 and 51, 11 and uh, 15 and 11 years respectively. To no great surprise, Glasgow's poor bore the brunt of premature death during the industrial age. Given that we are in this digitalization moment, you know, into the first uh, waves of digitalization, how might our graves reflect the similar dynamics? That's what's at stake. I think all of us would like to believe that in the early 21st century, uh, many of these problems of premature death amongst the poor would be alleviated. People might not have better lives, but at least they have longer lives. But that's not the case. In the United, in the United Kingdom, in Kensington, the rich live 10 years longer than, those, than the parts of the community that are poorer. In the United Kingdom, about 1% of the population holds 15% of the wealth, and a top 10% own 40%. By contrast, 37% of rich families are one paycheck away from destitution. In the United States, uh, 37 million people, or just above 10% of the population, live in poverty, with even more financially insecure. And that also carries across to food insecurity. Most people in the United States do not even have $400 for an emergency uh, supply. Nearly the same amount have no assets. In 2019, Jeff Bezos, then the wealthiest uh, uh, single person in the United States, was 21 times richer than Daniel Ludwig, his 1982 uh, counterpart. A decade ago, the wealthiest 1% of US households had a net worth that was 225 times greater than the medium household net worth. Uh, this is the highest ratio on record. Some other stats, the, United, the US's 1% has a combined wealth of $45 trillion, whereas the bottom 90%, and again, that's almost everyone else, has a combined worth of $43 trillion. US billionaires increased their wealth by 2.1 trillion during COVID-19. Uh, and this disparity is worth considering even while media outlets talk about a recovery. In another starting figure, since 1980, the 1% share of income has doubled, the 0.1% share has tripled, and the 0.01's share has quadrupled. As the world's 100 richest people increase their net worth, net worth, class stratification has cemented, limiting not only upward mobility, but removing basic social goods and public provisions. These, these burdens fall most hardest and the most vulnerable. By almost every measurable index, 
inequality is, is worsening and your opportunities for the 99% are shrinking. This political vulnerability is not an accident. It is a, it is a product of a long revanche in response, at least in the United States, to New Deal politics. It's, this project culminates in, in, in a neoliberal reset in the late 70s, early 80s, and we start to see the consequences of that uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. But that reset also brings calamity, chaos, and catastrophe. Since the 2008 Great Recession, a growing number of socialist critics and reformers have argued that the 1% are, through their agents, systematically stripping the 99% of their political, legal, and economic powers. The problem wealth inequality, social inequality, is it stresses political solidarity and social cohesion among citizens, while the poor face an ongoing precariousness, a process Saskia Session calls the savage sorting winners and losers. At the same time, the rich can generate differential political access and influence over subjectively desirable policies. In the United Kingdom, austerity politics has decimated political solidarity. Socially, austerity tends to be nasty to immigrants, workers, and minorities. It is contemptuous of the weak or lionizing the rich. The moral economy of the system predicates a person's wealth on the ability to make money or to boast how they do not need to use the state, even while most of their wealth comes from state procurement policies. S supposedly, you know, they aren't the free riders. They, do, they can boast how they do not need to the social protection of the poor. Besides, it's said, the wealthy do good things with their money. Supposedly, this investment in charity is reason enough to celebrate them. But this narrative is greatly mistaken. Comparing attitudes in the US population with enacted policy, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page found, and to quote, economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on US government policies or average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little to no independent interest, influence. This is one reason why we are in a decades plus democratic recession that has reverberations across the world. In short, Gillens and uh, Page show empirically that the policies in advanced capitalist countries, so the ones that are called the freest in the world, conform to the interests of the rich and democracy does not actually function. Democracy is not meaningfully enacted or form institutionally in enacted. It has no purchase. It is all artifice. With this in mind, I think that there's a need to have an assessment of life chances in, cap in contemporary capitalist societies, that this project has a degree of renewed urgency. Now, of course, we need to recognize that there are many factors outside of a person's so social economic position that can influence their life chances. We can think of place of birth, like my opening story, we can think of education, income, in addition to intersections with race, class, gender, sexuality, and other types of objective and subjective social uh, civic descriptions. So I do want to recognize and do want to foreground that the lived character of class has a distinctly multidimensional character. Still, I think that there's value to be had, as I said, we're thinking about a class at a higher level of abstraction, particularly given how class analysis and the things that come along with it are typically sidelined in Western capitalist societies, again, societies that claim to be the fairest, the freest and fairest in the world. Evermore, we see inequalities are caused by the genetic lottery of natural talents, 
a social lottery of opportunities to develop talents and a market lottery where persons uh, attributes become talents because they just happen to be in demand. These come to reinforce one another in shaping life chances and the prospects for almost all members of a society, particularly those that are born into the working class. To me, this is a great structural injustice. I'll explain a little bit about those injustices. Those that pray to mammon on the altar of capitalism do not see this. They consider inequality to be harmful only when it destabilizes investments and the reproduction of capital. This is the, the main talking point at places like the World Economic Forum. To what extent does social inequality stress cohesion that we cannot continue to make money? Only then does it become a priority to investigate. Never on its own terms, never for itself. Where once it was believed that hard work, savings, and a raising tide of growth would lift all boats, current conservative ideology sees market outcomes, whether successful or failures, as reflecting marginal contributions and so are just. This perspective neglects, however, to appreciate how, because of capitalism, not only do we not all have the same start in life, but many of us are not even in the same race. The most notable demonstration of the social problem and the social question comes from Thomas Piketty. He statistically shows that the share of global wealth held by a tiny fraction of the population rises much more rapidly than average global incomes. In short, we have the Matthews effect. Money begets money. This has consequences beyond the purchasing power of the rich who can raise their children in ways that near guarantee that they themselves will become rich. Intergenerational wealth ensures, as Matt O'Brien's research says, that poor kids who do everything right don't do better than rich kids who do everything wrong. I think that's a statement that very much holds for South Africa. In this respect, capitalists reduce, reproduce themselves in ways that exacerbate inequalities, creating a new class C. What we do see in, in the sociology of class is a lot of rapid de class decomposition of the professional managerial elements of our societies. We can maybe speak about that in the question period. One major cause of this vast social inequality uh, is that the dividends of economic growth slip through a democracy deficit. The result is what Blanco Milanovic calls the three stubborn modern three stubborn problems of modern inequalities. These are, and to sort of paraphrase them, the, the concentration of ownership of private assets, the creation of a new elite in capital and labor incomes and inter intergenerational transmission of advantage. What unites these differential structural uncertainties of life's chances is that the rich can maintain their station in life while ordinary people face extreme precarity. Indeed, profitability is predicated upon this precarity. All in all, it is clear that the current share of social value is the outcome of an ongoing historical struggle in, between capitalists and those that they employ. The extreme harm produced by the struggle is completely inconsistent with liberal principles of justice. And I want to reiterate that. It's completely inconsistent with liberal principles of justice. By liberal, I mean conditions where free will can be exercised, dignity is preserved, coercion is absent, and alienation is not a general feature of life. Drawing upon its conception, capitalist societies arguably retard more liberty than they deliver. There is a deep literature in moral philosophy on luck. This is the, the subject of this book over here. And while you know, I'll elaborate a little bit in our, the last portion of this talk over here, um, for the most part, we can think about luck in, you know, in this kind of basic fashion. The, the, you know, I'll give you the technical definition and we can get to sort of, we can make that a little bit easier to understand. The technical definition is antecedent causal factors that are beyond the person's 
uh, circumstances to control, which results in further constitution of their attributes or situations. The things that are beyond our control that shape who we are and what things we face. Luck plays a role in that. Depending on the circumstances, sometimes a role of contingency, radical contingency and chance, luck is downplayed when it comes to social inequality and political domination. We hear phrases like, it was your choice to pursue that chance. It was your choice to go study English or gender studies, or of course you're going to be unemployed. We hear these things all the time. These are the phrases, this is the rhetoric that we swim in. Why is it my problem if bad luck caused your ruin? Why didn't you get insurance? Such responses, such vocabulary, such rhetoric individuates and responsibilizes a person by making judgments that discount the social reality in which choices are made and which chances are appraised. This kind of individualism also discounts the social reality, how social reality was formed. It is a very uninspired sociological imagination, precisely at a time when we need to consider how multiple reinforcing forces shape our life chances. Such a task requires a sociological imagination that is open to new kinds of conceptualizations about the causes of social life. And to me, this is where the, the element of luck can come in. So there's a shorthand to try and understand the forces that are, help form society that are beyond the, any one person's ability to control. It's about a collective project. It's about a collective project living together. Luck, I think, is central to that. While concepts like intersectionality or intersectional privilege and accumulated advantage and disadvantage have proved useful in analysis of social inequality, and they are, they are incredibly useful, very, very helpful. I think that there's also a role for luck, that luck is also applicable to this task. Again, each kind of conceptualization has its place, and this is not about trying to rank concepts. There's no utility to be had in that. There's no value to be had in that. Let's take inter intersectionality. Intersectionality points to how the various dimensions of a person, like their class and their racial description, are rendered socially significant by systems, that these systems delimit their prospects um, and just treatment during an event. And if we think about how Kimberly Crenshaw has used this Weberian analysis to talk about class and status and institutional vision and gaze and how people come into being, from the outset, we can never say that it is one of those individual features that makes the difference. Intersectionality can only be determined at the point of, of the event itself. On prospects, Robert Merton writes that the ways in which initial comparative advantage of, of trained capacity, structural allocation, and available resources make for successive increments of advantage. We know how you know, if you're good at a task, you are able to become better that much quicker. You're, you are able to compound on the advantages that you have. And ultimately, for him, this means that the gap between the haves and the have-nots uh, typically widens. People experiencing who experience the compounding disadvantages and inequalities are not the problem. The means of these systems are the problem. The problem is that wealth determines your outcome. The problem is that we live in a society that allows, facilitates, condones, creates, is designed for that purpose. Moreover, as Sarah Ahmed observes, when you expose a problem, you become the problem. In affiliation with these perspectives, one of the benefits of luck is that it helps broaden our conceptual vision. Luck alludes not only to the sheer thrownness of a person into their world, their prenatal characteristics or their prenatal entry point into the world, but also their entire cosmology that precedes a person, which likewise shapes the cultural schema they receive. 
we know how the vocabularies, the grammars, the rhetorics that we grow up in come to shape how we understand chance, luck, work, effort, labor, reward, deservedness, justice. Beyond a person, while material history can explain much about the relations within a society, all societies are formed through contingency too. What I mean is that societies can have been otherwise. Granted, capitalism tends to commodify almost all aspects of social life, but tendencies are not inevitabilities. Nor is it inevitable that capitalism is the be all and end all of highly advanced social organizations. Social organization. There are alternatives and there are other potentials. It is a matter of historical contingency that capitalism is a prevailing global political economic system. There were other projects in modernity and they didn't win. There's a politics behind it, there's a history behind it, the material reasons behind that. This is not to say that there's no value in Piketty's economic econometric analysis, but rather I think that the other kinds of tests that we can use to think about what kinds of projects or uh, types of policies or types of interventions are required to address social inequality. I have one of these tests and I call it the quality of prospects. I'll speak about that for the last portion of this talk. Like Piketty, I set my target on the radical contingency of inheritances and the institutional potency that make those inheritances matter. How are they sustained? How are those inheritances sustained? But, but contrary to Piketty, one of the reasons I do so is because so much of social inequality research becomes about, and forgive me over here, because maybe this is a sympathetic audience over here, squabbles about data. Have we got enough data? Did we get more data? And then what? What are you going to do when you have that data? I think some of this discussions about empirical methods and, and in refining empirical methods and data collection and the like distract us about questions, more fundamental questions about ethics and exploitation. And that really distracts us from reform or for those of you who like-minded about revolutionary efforts. It can be difficult to reduce tally and represent the forces of luck as econometric data, nor can econometrics capture all the intricacies and latent reasons of the social practices that contribute to inequality. So one of the things I bring to you today is recognizing there's a plurality of methods, a plurality of perspectives, that humanistic inquiry matters too for the things that you are trying to accomplish, and they are worthy things that you are trying to accomplish. It would be foolish to claim that capitalism is the only social force that causes inequality. Still, it would be more foolish to claim that capitalism is not deeply embedded in creating and exacerbating various kinds of inequality. Ideas like, the, like prospects fill a space left over by econometric analysis or areas of econometric analysis isn't quite uh, suitable to investigate. By discussing prospects, life chances, luck, we can draw attention to areas that uh, might not be easy to capture with the current methods that we have. And so when I am starting to think about my test around the quality of prospects, I draw upon analytical Marxism. And again, you know, we, all, we all know that Marxism has many well-known shortfalls. You know, we range from the presumption ethics or ideology, or the suspicion that possible moral amelioration within capitalism is just nonsense or uh, preoccupation with romantic conceptions of artisanal work. Those things are all true, but, and the but matters. People working in the Marxist tradition, at least in the analytical Marxist tradition, incorporate a conception of justice that is worthy to explore and useful for our purposes. The attention to historiography and economics matters a great deal. And so it's within this literature that I believe that luck egalitarian arguments, thinking about how we can try to redistribute our luck. I know when I first say this term, it seems nonsensical. How can we might, how might we create conditions where we can redistribute our luck? We, we can start to pursue that. 
and we can use it to start to identify, assess, and with good fortune, try to overturn our social inequalities. My interest in like egalitarianism requires that you speak about a, a variety of species of like, and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty over here because is I find it boring. So if I find it boring, you're definitely going to find it boring, right? But so for our purposes, we can distinguish between two types of luck, like hard luck and institutional luck. And by hard luck, I take things that, you know, the basic phrase, things could have been otherwise, right? You could have been sitting there, you could have been sitting there, you could have sat there, right? It could have been otherwise. The options for you to exercise your ability and capacities to make and exercise decisions differently. Things could have been otherwise, right? This building could have been otherwise. This building could be designed slightly different. There's no natural law that says it had to be designed with this configuration. There are some maybe, there are some maybe natural laws about engineering tensions and the like, but they could have been designed slightly different. Okay? By institutional luck, I mean entrenched structural allocations of life chances as determined by our social forces. And to illustrate, I've spoken a little bit about how government policy favors capitalism. It doesn't matter if one individual capitalist gets lucky or not. What matters is that as a class, capitalists are, have a, work in a system, live in a system that is designed to make them systematically lucky. That's what matters. Not only do I want to mark out the differences between these two different kinds of luck, but also show that they have different types of ramifications for luck inequality, for luck egalitarianism. As you've heard me speak a little bit about on the theme and the motif of radical contingency, of the thrownness of the world, of the natality of our fortunes and the cosmologies in which they are set. That's the kind of radical contingency. And it shapes not only ourselves, our personhood, and the things we come to value in the ways that we can exercise our efforts and our work, our capacity to do so, but it extends also to the societies in which we exist. In. Okay, there's no natural law that South Africa has to be like this. It could be different. And indeed, I think we should make it different. There are uh, possible genuine alternatives, they exist. And of course, there remains the possibility of error. Yes, things uh, can be other ones. But we also recognize that there is a degree of unknown indeterminacy moral life. The reason I say this is I do want to keep space over to uh, enforce and underscore perhaps that our labors and our efforts matter. It, your choice to study economics, to play to the room, mattered. It mattered to you and it should, and should matter to us. That's not to take these things away from you. That's not to say that simply because there's radical contingency, all of these choices that you've made are meaningless. That's not the case at all. But rather it's to recognize that there's a contingent element to those choices that you make. The goal is not to undermine personhood. The goal is to create societies in which personhood and the development of your personhood really does matter. And you have a good, fair chance to do so. That you have quality prospects. Let's turn to institutional luck. So in the book itself, I survey several social analysis of the interplay between you know, choice and chance in late modernity that provide a sociological refinement to have a look at the structural allocations of life chances. How is it that people that go to this school get better life chances as opposed to people who go to that school? We know this. Sometimes we don't really want to admit it in our public discourse, but it's there. If you go to Eton, it's very different from going to Rhonda Bosch Boys High. If there's a Rhonda Bosch Boys High, I did. I'm new to Cape Town, so forgive me. <laughs> Contemporary sociological thought emphasizes a person's susceptibility to historical circumstance and the social roles that they occupy. A great number of sociologists have spoken about this from Veblen and Beck and Giddens and so on and so forth, right? Um, they've spoken about it in concepts like risk, luck, chance, and how these things have been co-opted by institutions to justify and administer the distribution of, of luck, both, both good and bad. We think about how risk society, particularly now in the age of climate catastrophe and the climate emergency, and which types of bodies are going to bear the risks 
there, there, it's not just it's just not hard luck. It's not just hard luck. It's not just hard luck that I live next to a dump. Choices were made for people like me to live in that place, or in our in South Africa's case, definitely not people like me. Okay. These circumstances involve the ratification and a social distancing of life chances away from the ordinary person. So they become so that we ourselves become oblivious to the asymmetrical burdens that risk carries between different classes. Some classes are much more exposed than others. If you drive to the airport, you know this, you can see it. It's part of our day-to-day -day reality in South Africa. And it's, a, and it's a great deal of the reality of many places across the world, all places across the world. The concept of uh, institutional luck is analytically useful because it points to the social construction of life chances and how they're skewed by certain uh, 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 bases like class, race, gender. I think over here, what, what I'm trying to point to is how we need to try demystify our ordinary explanations for how people have certain uh, outcomes in their lives. It's not just all my own labor. It's not just my own chances. There are things beyond that. We also need to recognize that there's a vested interest in mystifying the chances that we have to not give them a proper account, to not look at how your school shapes the type of person you could be. We don't want to look too closely at how the sausage is made because to do so might, might show that we are complicit in perpetuating these injustices. It cuts a little bit close, too close to the bone to draw upon the earlier motif. I think we need to reflect upon the types of rhetorics, languages, concepts, that come to reinforce and legitimize, really legitimize, responsibilitize how life chances are redistributed. These things are sociological, they're not individual. For me, and we'll start to close off the session with these uh, remarks, these observations for me provide a rationale for lucky egalitarianism, a political theory that seeks to return power and dignity to those whose bad hard luck is compounded by bad institutional luck. If you're born in Lunga, that's a, I think we can all say that's objectively not a good place to be. If we had all the, if we had to do the rules and test of where you want to be born, not many of us would choose to be there. But then we say, okay, well, what schooling does a person in Lunga get? Bad hard luck, bad institutional luck. What can we expect? And then when our social programs are so inadequate, that we have these massive problems in South Africa. And I don't need to go through and list them because if I had to just do a bullet point listing, we'll be here for an hour. We need to think about these things at a much more fundamental level. And I think we also need to recognize that we ourselves are responsible for the people around us because we have cho we choose to be in a society. How can we find ways to change a person's bad hard luck, which is compounded by bad institutional luck. What do we need to do? What do we owe other people? Other people deserve much more than what they have. We owe it to them. This understanding of inequality is rooted in people being concerned with the welfare of others. So much so that we're willing to meet other people's needs, thereby diminishing uh, inequalities irrespective of luck. Equality becomes a vocabulary to act, to take on the burdens so that we can provide provisions to those who do not have, to get them to a point that they may be able to provision others. If we think about the social reproduction of social inequality, how can we think about the social reproduction of egalitarianism? What do we need to do? Why should require another entry point? My point over here is to try and make you aware of another kind of subordination, one that doesn't quite get as much attention as it deserves. By insisting on a free and fair and equal system, 
we would say that we're not leaving people up to fate. Like egalitarianism seeks to create a morally respectable politics, we, we recognize that our faiths are entwined. Right now, capitalism does recognize that our fates aren't fine, but that's because of exploitation. My success is your loss. My rents are your exploitation. How might we, how might we connect our fates differently? The presence of bad luck provides grounds for redistribution and compensation for the resultant disadvantages, whereas the presence of good luck provides grounds to redistribute in a proportional fashion because the resultant advantages were not entirely deserved. Most of the advantages that I've had in my life, I did not deserve them. And there are a number of American theorists, particularly in a conservative vein, that are making arguments now that you can receive things because you will show the promise to deliver on them. So the reward comes before the dessert. What, what, are, the, what, are, the, what are the implications of that? Because it doesn't give people the opportunity to even get to show whether they can deserve or not, whether they can develop the capacities or not. It's a troublesome argument. I'm going to end off with this final point, and we can then turn to uh, questions, answers, shackles, if you wish. You can march me down the street if you feel so. <laughs> to end, a good test is how 21st century liberalism uh, treats social inequality. How does it treat the social inequalities that uh, come from uh, and the ways that gen genetic, social, and market lotteries come to create good and bad luck? The target should not be how to limit uh, how chance is used as a political, uh, the, the, sorry, the target should be to limit how chance is used as a political instrument to further discriminate uh, and justify oppression, exploitation, and alienation. For me, it is only through such scrutiny that any equitable and humanely rational society is even possible. So I thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. And I say, if you want to shackle me and march me down the streets, you would not be the first. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was extremely helpful. Do we have any questions from the floor? Thank you, Urban. Um, so these are big themes. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so I, I want to put a long, I'm already a kind of historical perspective on big distribution issue that, <laughs> that, that you're concerned about. So Piketty's Analysis in very simple terms is, you know, that the that, that West returns at the end of the 20th century to levels of inequality that it last saw a century before in the age of the robber barons and uh, and, uh, and and the, the sort of height of imperialism um, and, uh, and and so on. Um, but uh, somebody like Robert Gordon writing on the history of the U.S. economy. Uh, also tells us that that's the age, the period from say 18, the 1870s to the 1900s, when great inventions that made those who exploited those technologies very wealthy uh, changed the standards of living over the next century for working people. And so living conditions in uh, working class households in Europe and in America by the 1950s, because of the, the invention of uh, the city and, and the uh, uh, network infrastructure that makes uh, uh, city living possible, uh, the replacement of the horse with the automobile, the introduction of telecommunications, uh, the modernization of healthcare, all of these things uh, 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 change living conditions in, in, in working households in, in ways, Robert Gordon argues, in, in ways that were far more important for living standards than anything that is happening now. Um, to your point about luck egalitarianism, 
this is also the period in which social insurance is invented. Europe does better than that than the States, but the States also has uh, institutions of, uh, of, uh, of social insurance that provide some protection, but clearly not enough. Yes. So, so the question that I think your analysis raises in my mind, I think this is what you're pointing to at the end, but I want you to say more about it is, well, what are the, what are the, what are the institutional changes, the analogs of the invention of social insurance in Bismarck and Germany? Uh, uh, what are the analogs that are relevant to the technological changes that we're now experiencing uh, that might relate to the world of work? Uh, to, climate change, other things. Uh, there's a, there, there are other levels of social insurance that you have in mind, but you've not told us very much about that. Yeah, that's a very good question. And thank you. The, the things that you point to are real. I would have one or two footnotes. Those are small items. When it comes to social insurance, the, the, the story to me that I think doesn't get told quite enough is how working class people designed, advocated, and emerged from these, uh, or emerged from working class conditions, that people created you know, unions and used insurance within unions, and then were able to use the progressive politics of the era to try institutionalize this in state, the state forms. So to me, I think that's, that's somewhat telling of some of the mechanisms that working class people who are bearing a brunt of these technological changes, these disruptions, how they might respond and what types of things that they think are useful. Just on that, I'll come back to the main point. So this is a bit of a sidebar. One of the ideas that I'm starting to see more and more frequently within digital in, amongst working class people who are studying digital society is data unions as a way to say, okay, we're generating all of these, this tremendous wealth from our user data, this is all user generated data. you are commodifying it, intermediaries are selling it, repacking advertising dollars, but we've done the unpaid work for it, you know, let's start to remunerate that. And so I start to wonder what might data unions uh, paired with platform corporatism, what kinds of platforms might we have, what type of social organization for the things that are on our phone that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that gets back to one of the points I'm trying to convey over here, is that there's a need for a lot of experimentation. We're at, I think, at the very dawn of the types of institutions, programs, exercises that, uh, that uh, re will require, I think, two things. One is new types of uh, interventions, but also I think reinforcing the th some of the things that we've lost. One of the, and not to sort of create in the 1950s rosy last view of the world, but we can see that inequality isn't as great there because, you know, having gone to war, working class Americans and people in, the, in Europe say, okay, well, now you have to give us provisions. We've done this for you, you now have to give us provisions. And so they are starting to negotiate and bargain with the state and, and the ruling class. I think that trying to leverage that power again is something that's not done frequently enough. So I think there does need to be a revitalization of the, of the labor movement uh, and the types of or don't, organic demands that come from, from movements like that are very, very useful. The other thing, going back to Piketty, is you know the political problem over here is is one of who has the most influence in society because that undermines democratic life or the prospects for democratic life. So it's great that they that my working uh, that my living conditions are great. I like the many machines that are around me. I would not trade those machines. I would I I like my fridge. I want to keep my fridge right. I want to keep cancer drugs. Those things are good. But the question is is what does the wealth from these products end up doing and who gets to make decisions? grand scale decisions about society. And I think if you think about who's directing investments over here, you know, that shape, who decides on investments and their money put in, has a great deal of like, do we have more cancer drugs or do we have more widgets and so on and so forth. That's, it's a bit of a sketchy answer, but I think it's a very, very good question. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, thank you for because quite a lot of this is new to me, so it's really, so I might be asking uh, of this question, but one of the things that I noticed that's missing, or you didn't mention, is a C word, and corruption. Um, so there's luck, and there's in this notion of corruption, and structural corruption. 
um, and that much of what you sketch is based on ideas of what you said is legitimate and, and illegitimate. Or maybe you haven't said illegitimate, but perhaps it's illegitimate. Um, and so I'm curious how we then integrate an idea of luck into a system that is based on morally and ethically, like you said, really problematic yeah. ideas. And then in terms of taking on a kind of ideology critique perspective, um, and in terms of Marxist perspective, then you've got to ask some questions about how we talk about corruption as an element of wealth generation or not. So as you know, in South Africa, if you're black and wealthy, you must be corrupt. If you're white and wealthy, well, you've worked hard. Um, or or you it was based on an illegitimate system of, of wealth. So there's that contesting idea. But there's no space for um, uh, an egalitarian idea of wealth or, or, or equality of, of prospects in the current debate. It just seems to be these extremes. Yeah. Um, and it's the same in the US and the UK. And you know, often you're pointing out, well, actually, that's just as corrupt as, you know, well, that the nature of um, the inheritance inheritances are are problematic um, from their, you know, from their very beginning. And yeah. I think this is where your point, which I really want to um, sort of uh, agree with, is coming back to the, the historiography of the um, economics in the sense that much of the tale of wealth in the West begets the utter decimation and destruction of quality of prospects outside of the capitalist system in the global south. So even what we celebrate as, as, as a golden age was on the backs of a removal of a different style of life, a different way of living. Maybe, you know, it, it could have benefited from a fridge, but, you know, it was, it was still a life to, there, be, to be led. Yeah. Even the golden years yeah. are come on the back of gender inequality. Yeah. So, so these are these are great questions. Um, corruption is a practical problem. You know, the, like no ideal system of, of justice is going to get can account for the ordinary types of things. You know, the type of anthropology we have as people living in the 21st century. Uh, I don't like, really like using the word nature, but maybe we'll just use it as a shorthand. Is that, that currently it's some nature that people are gonna be, like, gonna be like this. But I think that's one of the reasons why I think democratic solutions are very valuable. You have a lot of you know, uh, pragmatists, particularly American pragmatists, who talk about the virtues of democracy. Now, those virtues are there. You know, constitutionalism is fantastic. But one of the best things about democracy is you can throw the buggers out. You can get rid of them. You can, you can give, you can afford new people the chance to try run the state, to run the bureaucracy. And I think those things matter quite a bit. So, you know, can we, can we create material redistribution that there are, let's say in South Africa, chances that we can have real political alternatives because we're not locked into one type of party. I think if we, if we have a redistribution of wealth in this country, you know, it's not to say that it's guaranteed, there's no history can't guarantee anything. But if, you, if we start to have a redistribution, you may have new types of political parties, and now you can then start to have real democratic contest uh, based upon the types of coalitions, organizations, affiliations, allegiances that are more ordinary. I think the, the point is that I'm trying, to, that I'm trying to say is that you know, no matter any ideal system of justice is always going to have these difficulties. And so these are operational matters, and I'll again not to say that they aren't important, but the, to me, I think the the, the the, those, those are downstream from thinking about how to create conditions under which democracy can thrive. And democracy can only thrive when you have, uh, when property and the ownership of property doesn't become the sole determinant of how society looks. One of the reasons that people typically don't like democracy is because property tends to concentrate and people who have property are very worried that people without property will vote to take their property away. And so the, 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 the contest between those who are property and those without property are one of the central dynamics of the democratic life. But if we start to think about how can we ensure that more people have property, you know, that we have issues about how people are invested in their societies, invested in concerns with others, types of social goods that come from cooperation. Um, I'm also gonna say as a sort of final point is I'm maybe gonna use Marx's term over here, is that 
you know, we can't write uh, cookbooks for the kitchens of the future. We don't know what they what they will have. And so maybe that also gets back down to what kinds of mechanisms do we do we will we need for uh, the future and even maybe the near future. It's a bit of a cop out, but thank you. Have you have any questions? In the room, man. So, Scott, thank you very much. If anyone wants to chat a little bit with Scott, with Scott they could like, find it today and like, talk about it. I, I've spoken a lot, so I'm more than happy to have other people speak a bit and give my 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 voice a chance to rest. So, if you have things to say, I'm more than happy to hear them. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>